Hello and welcome to At a Crossroads, China's post-pandemic economic relations with Latin America and the Caribbean, a discussion brought to you by Boston University's Global Development Policy Center and the Inter-American Dialogue. This morning, we have for you an exciting discussion, I think, with several uh, panelists that we're privileged to host today. Before we get started, I'll introduce a few of the logistics. Um, our host will guide us through about a 40-minute discussion with the panelists here today. If you have questions during this time, please go ahead and jump in and add those to the Q&A section. You'll see a button for it at the bottom of your Zoom screen. When you add a question, make sure to add your own information, your name and affiliation, so we know who we're talking to. At the end of this 40-minute discussion, we'll open are, we'll open it up to questions from the audience uh, for the rest of our session. Do bear in mind during this time that we are live streaming this event and it will be available on our YouTube channel, which you can find at bu.edu slash GDP. With that, I'll turn it over to our moderator, Fermin Kup, who is the Southern Cone editor of Dialogo Chino and an expert on the theme who I'm privileged to welcome to our center's virtual space. Take it away, Fermin. Hi, thanks, Becky. Good morning, everyone. Good afternoon or good evening, depending on which part of the world you are watching us. Thanks for joining, first of all. Thanks for making the time. Uh, we are looking forward to having a fantastic discussion with, with our speakers here, which I'll, I'll be introducing in a minute. But, but as, as Becky said, please feel free to leave any questions that you might have for any of our speakers. We will we'll make sure to have some time at the at the end of the discussion to do a little bit of Q&A with everyone and we look forward to that as well as so at any point during the during the talks feel free to leave your questions uh so as, as Peggy was saying the today's talk is framed as at a crossroads China's post economic relations with Latin America and the Caribbean as we know Latin America and the Caribbean has been one of the regions most affected and economically speaking from covid uh, this is still taking a toll uh, across the region. Uh, inflation remains to be a big issue in many of the countries in the region, uh, with still a lot of knock-on effects from the Russia war in Ukraine. At the same time, China is also facing many uncertainties uh, with questions over its growth for this year. And this puts us uh, on a, an interesting time to reflect on the links between China and Latin America, uh, a relation that has been scaling up quite significantly over the last couple of decades uh, on many aspects, politics, economics, and including on the environment as well. So this uh, puts us on an interesting spot to start. Um, I'm just going to introduce our three speakers for today. Margaret Myers is the director of the Asian Latin America program of the Inter-American Dialogue. Rebecca Ray, uh, who introduced me, is the senior academic researcher at the Boston University Global Development Policy Center. And Ignacio Tornero is the founder and CEO of East Consulting and also an associate professor at the Catholic University of Chile. Thanks so much for the three of you to uh, make the time to uh, speak and uh, looking forward to to discussing a little bit the state of play on, on the relationship between the, the, the region and, and China as well. Let's start off with, with Becky. Um, Becky, so the, the Global Development Policy Center recently published its new China, Latin American, Caribbean Economic Bulletin, which is a, a really interesting document with uh, relevant data and information regarding China and Latin America, which I, I would suggest everyone to have a look if you haven't done already. But just to give us a little bit of a picture, and we actually got the link there on the chat box to the to the bulletin. Thanks for that. Uh, Becky, could you tell us a little bit some of the highlights from the publication and what kind of trends uh, would you highlight from the China Latin America relationship in terms of trade and investment from last year? I'd be happy to. Thank you, Fermin. Uh, if I had to point at a few themes of where we see the relationship trending, uh, those themes would be diversification, it would be a, a maturing of the relationship, and it would be the, the, the forefronting of Latin America and Caribbean goals in the relationship. So in 
one uh, misconception that I frequently hear in casual conversations and in uh, some media reporting is that Latin America and the Caribbean is kind of switching its preference for trade and investment from traditional relationships with the US and Europe and towards relationships with China. Instead, a framework that better fits the evidence that we've been tracking in the bulletin is a diversification of those relationships to incorporate China in addition to maintaining traditional relationships. And by that, I mean, if we look at the trading relationships specifically, it's frequently cited that China is now the top export market for South America. And that's true. China is the top export market for South America and particularly several larger economies in in the region such as Chile and Brazil. However, this is not to the same extent that the US is the top export market for Mexico, for Haiti, for Dominican Republic and several Central American countries. When we think about those traditional relationships, Mexican exports, for example, 80 to 90% of them still go to the US. In fact, exports to China and the Europe combined only account for about five or 10% of what the exports to the US are for Mexico, Dominican Republic, Haiti, Nicaragua. This is a very strong tie into one export market. What we see with countries that predominantly export to China, and here again, I'm talking about Brazil, Peru, Chile, a few others, we're seeing a much more balanced approach where a small majority of the exports are going to China. Instead, countries are opting to try to export to as many countries as possible. And we see most countries in the region trading about the same amount between exports to China, the US, and the US, uh, China, the US, and the European Union, the three traditional, or at this point, the three predominant export markets. So really, we're not seeing a switch towards a special relationship with China so much as a taking advantage of the opportunity to trade with more partners. We also see that in investment. I uh, and many other watchers of this relationship have touted the fact or have pointed, highlighted the fact that new supply chains really are beginning to emerge as a focal point for this relationship, particularly in Chile. And I really look forward to Ignacio's comments on that from a Chilean perspective um, regarding upstream green energy and renewable, via, I'm sorry, renewable energy and electric vehicles, uh, resources like lithium, copper, others, as well as downstream like electric vehicle manufacturing, and electric vehicle charging networks. But this is also true for the region's relationships with other partners. So we see the region incorporating China into its existing priorities and its existing goals. And I would even say that we see this in Ecuador's free trade agreement that they've just signed with China. It's relatively boilerplate. I haven't taken my economist lens to all 750 pages of it, but what I've read of it so far appears to be relatively boilerplate, but front-loading Ecuador's priorities of pushing non-traditional agricultural sector exports that Ecuador is hoping to amplify that aren't particularly the important sectors for Chinese demand from Ecuador yet, but that Ecuador is hoping to grow. And so we see Ecuador engaging with China regarding its own priorities of diversification, both in terms of what it exports and who it exports to, rather than the early years of that relationship in which China needed oil, Ecuador had oil and was looking for someone to sell it to. And very clearly, this was a special relationship built on one traditional commodity. So we're seeing, I'm seeing from the, the trends that we track with the bulletins, diversification, uh, maturation of the relationship and Latin America approaching China with its own interests in mind, rather than simply being a pawn or a ploy uh, or a, a region to be wooed. Thanks. Thanks, Becky. That, that was really, really interesting insights. So definitely, I would recommend everyone, if you haven't read the, the bulletin yet, there's a lot of uh, info to dig in. I mean, there's one of the publications to, to have an eye on uh, in terms of the links between China and Latin America. And 
That brings me to uh, another recent update. Uh, so, uh, Margaret, you and Becky have also recently published an update on, on China's uh, sovereign lending to a region, uh, referencing uh, your document, which is called the Chinese Loans to Latin America and the Caribbean Database, another uh, really flagship document in terms of the relationship between China and Latin America. In the, in the database, we see that there's been a, a decline in Chinese investment finance institution lending in recent years. But uh, Margaret, it would be great if you can give us a little bit of sense into other ways in which the relationship between China and Latin America is evolving and whether the China uh, lack financial engagement uh, is also at the crossroads. Thank you. Thank you, Fermin. It's an excellent question. Um, yes, I mean, so for, for those who aren't familiar with our, our work on, on finance or with the database, um, I've had the pleasure of working with with Becky and the and the broader uh, GDP Center team uh, for a number of years now. We've been tracking this, you know. Gosh, Becky, I don't know where we are now. How many years we've been doing this all together? But um, but we track all the way back uh, to 2015 and even before. Uh, in certain cases, when we saw the first incidents of of Chinese uh, development finance institution, so China Development Bank, China Export Import Bank lending to the region. Um, and so this is sovereign lending that we are tracking, right? Loans to governments or else to state-owned enterprises in the region. And just as you noted, Fermin, uh, you know, we've seen a real decline in activity since, you know, the, a peak in, in 2010, essentially, when we saw approximately 35 billion, uh, you know, issued or to, to the region in the form of, of lines of credit and loans. Um, and so, what we did see, interestingly, last year is what we called an uptick in activity. Uh, but by that, I mean just about just over $800 million in loans issued to the region and specifically to three countries, $500 million to Brazil uh, and specifically to the Banco de Brasil, which was, and that money is intended to be used for social projects across the country. Um, Exim Bank uh, issued in the Caribbean two loans also, one to Barbados for uh, the Scotland Road uh, Rehabilitation Project, that was $121 million concessional lending. Uh, and then another uh, concessional loan of $192 million to Guyana for a phase two of the East Coast Road Project, so two road-related or transport-related infrastructure projects there. Um, we call this an uptick, but, you know, it hardly... <laughs> amounts to, you know, a resurgence, uh, you know, necessarily in, in overall finance and certainly not a return to these peak levels of, of you know, state-to-state -state finance that we saw, um, you know, a number of years ago. Um, what we do see and what's interesting, uh, you know, given where these loans headed this year was a real focus on, on the Caribbean. And that's been the case, uh, you know, for a number of years now. Uh, there was no lending in, in 2020, but what we did see in, in terms of loans, you know, over the past few years, um, you know, they went to various countries in the region, but the Caribbean comprised a significant portion of, of overall recipients. The amounts aren't particularly big, but smaller amounts go much further um, in, the, in the case of, 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 of the Caribbean. Some of these loans, and mo the vast majority of these loans are infrastructure related, but often have a sort of climate component component to them in the sense that, you know, transport infrastructure is very much a part of, of climate related adaptation, right? When things get destroyed uh, by hurricanes or other extreme weather events, then, then of course, um, you know, infrastructure development is, is fundamental and the rebuilding of, of infrastructure is also a critical portion of this. What we're also imagining is that we'll probably be more in the way of, of finance from these two institutions, China Development Bank and China Export Import Bank in the coming years. Uh, we've seen a lot of talk and Fermin, you can fill us in on this about Kauchari, right? That's a, that was a, a project, you know, the largest uh, solar solar project in South America. It was financed, um, you know, initially in 2017 by, by an Exim Bank loan, at least in part, 85%. Um, and it's looking to be expanded into phases four and five. And indeed, you know, the, the government of Huhui, but also broader, you know, Argentina uh, engagement has, has been dedicated toward achieving some sort of deal, as I understand it, with either ICBC or Exim Bank to, to finance that particular operation. Uh, Bolivia, too, you know, has been working on, uh, you know, two zinc refineries and, and, and securing um, 
some finance for those from from China. Um, and then we've seen, you know, most recently when when Honduras cut ties with Taiwan and established them with China, a real interest in, uh, I think, in doing so in order to secure finance uh, for the Patuca Dos, you know, uh, dam, which, you know, follows on another dam project that China supported a number of years ago and is part of a three-part series of dams uh, that has been on, on the agenda, the infrastructure plan for Honduras for a number of years now. So a lot may materialize also, uh, you know, this year. We'll be tracking all of this very closely, and I would imagine we'll also see some interesting activity in the Caribbean, just as we have uh, in, in, in recent years. Um, I would also say, you know, that uh, there are, although we haven't seen, we are not seeing the, you know, big levels of multi-billion dollar lending that we've seen in the past, there are a lot of other important commercial um, uh, banks and other banks, financial institutions that are providing finance either directly to Chinese companies or sometimes to Latin American companies or even Latin American governments um, for specific projects um, or simply to support uh, you know, uh, government um, uh, interests at various phases in 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 these relationships. There were some money issued by I ICBC, for example, amid the pandemic, simply to deal with you know pandemic related challenges in some of these countries. So, um, you know, between the commercial banks, companies themselves bringing finance to bear. Um, and uh, now some very interesting examples of lending from the New Development Bank, the, the BRICS Bank, right, um, and the Asian Infrastructure Bank to, to members in the region. Um, there is a, a much more complex and diversified landscape, a lot more sources of finance. In total, they do not replicate the, the sort of, you know, the peak lending that we saw from, from the development finance institutions, you know, back a number of years ago. But they are financing some very interesting projects. And in fact, the new development bank projects, the BRICS bank projects, most of them obviously went to, to Brazil in the context of, of the Latin American region, um, but were mostly focused on, on climate and, and, and social programs. Um, and so that I think, you know, really uh, is supportive of, of Becky's point that we are seeing a lot of interest in support for you know, initiatives that that countries in in Latin America are indeed advancing. Uh, so an effort to explore really an access of interest and common interest on the part of all of these parties. Uh, so we'll see what materializes next year, Becky and I and, and, and our teams will be, keep, be keeping a very close eye on it. But those are the developments at present. Thanks, Margaret. Yeah, a lot to, to unpack in there with uh, with what you you and Becky said. Uh, a lot of recent developments in, in the region, uh, especially focus on the, the energy sector and the, the energy transition, as you said, with, with Cauchari in Argentina, the possibility of Cauchari expanding into a second phase uh, and, and other developments as well that are always present in terms of hydro with, uh, with pending projects uh, across the region and new projects coming up and a lot of m and uh, and and a lot of developments in the region to, to look at to look for. Uh, thanks, Margaret. That was that was really interesting. And I'm gonna jump to Chile for a moment, and we're gonna speak a little bit with Ignacio. Uh, Ignacio, thanks for joining us uh, as well. Uh, as we as we know, the relationship between China and Chile has been uh, very dynamic with a lot of developments uh, in in recent years uh, in trade, uh, in, in the economic sector, in finance. Uh, really, really wide and comprehensive. Uh, what kind of trends have you recently seen in terms of the, the economic relationship between ch the two countries and what actors and factors do you think are shaping the deal making at the moment? Well, thank you for me and thank you also the Inter-American Dialogue <clears throat> and the PU Global Development Policy Center for this kind of invitation. And, and I would like to address what's happening in Chile from a, a three dimension. The first one is like a political one and the second one is trade and final investment, and also refer to the main actors and factors that are shaping the Chile-China relationship. So I would say, firstly, that the relationship with China from a political perspective has been very stable and pragmatic from the establishment of diplomatic relations back in the 70s. And that's probably, uh, this, uh, it's been a similar approach, been followed uh, since then, I mean, regardless of the coalition that's been ruling in Chile, and, and that's 
I would say that's very important to understand why we see uh, a very stable diplomatic relationship between Chile and China. And, and the relationship with and China and Chile has been focusing mainly uh, at the beginning on trade, that investment, and more recently in other aspects, such as like the transfer of technology, uh, e education, cooperation, and so on. I would say that these, the political factor is a very important foundation for us to explain and understand why trade and investment is being uh, increasing since the 70s between Chile and China. Uh, from a trade perspective, uh, it's probably one, the, the most important milestone between in the relationship was the establishment and the execution of a free, free trade agreement between Chile and China back in 2005, that then turned into force the year after. Uh, we were the first single economy that actually signed an FTA with China. So it's very important to know that, to explain the amount of trade that we are having with China nowadays. Last year, regardless, the trade war, regard, regardless uh, COVID-19, uh, we, we, we reached a huge amount of trade with China. China, uh, or of a total of 60, 65.5 billion US dollar, uh, 39 billion in exports, 26 billion in imports from China. So we have, uh, we are a few of the Latin American countries that have a trade surplus with China. So that figure represents 33% of our total trade with the world. So one third is going to China or is with China. Uh, just to give you some perspective, like back in, after the execution of the free trade agreement, back in 2002, we just traded with China 2.5 billion uh, US dollars. Um, as I said before, I would, I would like to point out that trade with China has been very resilient, regardless of the trade war with the US and the appearance of COVID-19. To give an idea, between 2017 and 2022, the uh, total trade grew at, at an average rate of 14%, uh, 16% for exports and 11% for the imports from China. Um, uh, however, uh, our trade with China, of course, uh, uh, has certain challenges. And the first one is very, I mean, the highly concentration in certain types of products. It's a very copper related uh, relationship. 64% of our exports uh, are copper related products and mining related pro uh, products represent 82% of the tr trade relationship with China. Lithium, it's uh, increasing its importance. Uh, last year, it represented almost 6 billion US dollars of uh, uh, exports to China, cherries almost two, and timber 1.5 billion US dollars. What we are importing from China is mainly uh, vehicles, smartphones, and other technological equipment. And here, I definitely agree with uh, Becky that uh, there is a huge challenge, challenge for diversification. That's been a huge topic here in, uh, in Chile in terms of like, we need to di diversify our destinations of our exports, not just rely on China. At the same time, we need to diversify, diversify the amount of products that we are exporting to China and to the world. In terms of uh, foreign direct investment, uh, I always like to call this a new phenomenon. In the case of Chile, uh, before 2018, we didn't receive a lot of Chinese investment. There were other countries such as Venezuela, Argentina, and others that were receiving uh, more Chinese investment uh, at that time. Um, one of the main factors I would like to mention here is like the government in Chile uh, does not have a very um, active role in our economy. That explains the limited amount of Chinese investment that we had before. There's a very solid rule of, law, rule of law and institutions. There was the lack of Chinese experience in the public tender processes. And finally, also, there's a limited Chinese community in town. Uh, again, uh, mentioning Becky's comments, I agree. Uh, I would like to provide some perspective on how important China is for in this FDI relationship, because other partners such as Canada, the US and Spain are even more important in terms of the stock of uh, FDI accumulated in Chile in the last uh, couple of years. So uh, based on the Ch China Global Investment Tracker information, we have the China between 2005 and 2022, it has accumulated uh, roughly uh, 16 billion US dollars in Chile, and that represents uh, almost half of the amount of the stock of investment by Canada, which is number one, the US and Spain. And again, it's also a very concentrated uh, relationship. It's mainly for indirect investment from China, it's mainly going to the metals and, and energy sector, representing 84% of the total. However, we've seen recently diversification uh, uh, and, and some capital, Chinese capital going to fisheries, agribusiness, and infrastructure. I would say that infrastructure, the development of public infrastructure specifically, is probably going to be a very active sector in the coming years, especially because of the pandemic, and the needs of Chile to keep developing its own infrastructure, meaning 
subway lines, hospital, toll roads, and, and so on. Just to mention a, bit, a little bit about the main actors and factors, I would say in Chile, at least uh, we have, we've seen both Chinese state-owned enterprises and private enterprises being very active depending on the sectors. In the regulated ones, such as the power sector, we do see uh, more uh, activity of Chinese state-owned enterprises, such as State Grid Corporation of China, China Southern Power Grid, China Three Gorges. In the large-scale mining, we see, we've seen a more uh, participation of private companies. So that was the acquisition, for instance, of Tianqi Lithium. In the infrastructure sector, we do see more SOEs. I would say the main player here has been CRCC, China Railway Construction Corporation. We also have the activity of Chinese banks, both policy banks and commercial banks. In the fisheries and, and agribusiness, we do we see both. We have seen, for instance, the activity, the, the acquisition uh, of Joy Bio of Australis or the acquisition of Yangha Distillery of a stake of uh, one of the main winers here. And just to finalize, finalize, in the technology sector, we do see a more, of course, it's more private. We, we have seen uh, companies such as Didi, Huawei, and Xiaomi, they've been very active uh, in the recent years in, in Chile. Thank you. Thanks, Ignacio. That, that's uh, really interesting and, and a lot of similarities and also differences to what's happening in, in Argentina as well. Uh, we have the presidential elections coming up uh, in, in Argentina this year, uh, which uh, might open a new paradigm uh, in terms of the relationship between China and the, and the country. There uh, seems to be, at least based on the polls, uh, a strong movement to the right, uh, with even an extreme right candidate with a large percentage of the votes. And this could lead to uh, changes in the relationship with China. We have all we, we, got, we have actually seen uh, in the past uh, from a shift to to left to right in in Argentina with the presidency of of Macri, some initial doubts of the links with with China, which actually ended up going backwards then and accepting uh, the relationship with with China. So. We'll we'll see how it goes, but uh, we we saw a lot of movement in terms of the lithium sector recently in in Chile, with the with the announcement by by President Boric to um, have a higher control from the state uh, and uh, basically force private companies to partner up with the state to extract lithium and and this a little bit contradicts what we are seeing in Argentina in which uh, the government is basically opening up the lithium sector to private companies with uh, with the a role of the state that is really diminished and, and doesn't participate much on the on the market but uh, and because of that a lot of Chinese companies have started uh, showing a lot of interest on the lithium sector in, in Argentina from from extracting the mineral to producing uh, batteries. There are a few projects on the pipeline uh, for this to happen eventually in the coming years. And even to EVs or public buses, uh, at least try to find some added value. And there's been flexibility from the Chinese companies to, to, to do that, to do this and not just uh, extract, the, extract the mineral per se. But so I'm expecting there's going to be a lot of movement in terms of the of the lithium sector probably on, on the coming years. Uh, uh, also with uh, with Bolivia recently partnering up with the Chinese company uh, uh, to jointly uh, seek a way forward in the sector with, with the government. So a lot of movement uh, in there. So thanks, thanks the three of you. And we, we're gonna do a, another round of questions uh, in a minute, but just to remind everyone, feel free to leave your questions on the chat box. Uh, I'm seeing a really nice flow of questions there. Thanks for that. Uh, we already got six we are going to get to them in a, in a minute but but thanks for your questions and please feel free to to leave those there we are we are keeping track of them as we as we speak um so just to continue and to keep the ball rolling um let me go back to you becky uh on the on the bulletin which you made a reference to in a few minutes back uh you you expl explained an uh, detailed uh, case which is quite interesting in terms of a chinese company uh and a dispute settlement in in ecuador in 2022 could you tell us a little bit of what happened there and the kind of repercussions that this uh, had uh, for overall chinese investment and thinking even uh on a on a broader picture on the social social environmental angle of, of Chinese investment in the region and the repercussion of this. Yeah, thanks for asking that question, Fermin. I think that this is a, a case that's largely flown under the radar uh, for most of 
of those of us who, who are watchers of this relationship, but might have really important repercussions across the region regarding Chinese investment in these new supply chains with new minerals. This is the first uh, investor state dispute that has opened between a Chinese company and any Latin American country over environmental regulations that has ever happened. Now, traditionally, the relationship with China has been one that has been characterized by Chinese firms' willingness to go along with whatever regulatory changes might happen in Latin American governments. So as Ignacio and, and Fermin have mentioned regarding left, right switches with governments, Chinese firms have been willing to stay and continue to work with whatever regulatory changes may come along rather than selling out of the region if there's a potential for regulatory changes that might increase their costs. But in this case, We've seen Junefield, a Chinese private gold mine company, sue uh, or bring a dispute against Ecuador for suspending their environmental license because they had inadequate consultation with affected indigenous communities. Um, this is really interesting because this is a new phenomenon for Chinese companies. Traditionally speaking, our work in the past with case studies, the work of many other observers of this relationship have noted um, a willingness and ability of Chinese companies to live either up to or down to whatever the environmental regulations of a host country are, thereby showing the importance of host countries to set communicate and enforce strong environmental and social regulations that meet their needs without fear that they might be reacted to, without fear of any kind of dispute being open. This is the first instance where we've seen a Chinese firm take on some of the less beneficial characteristics of their Western peers in this regard. And in fact, this is a new phenomenon for China in general, if we look at UNCTAD, the UN Conference on Trade and Development, they keep a list of all investor state disputes that have opened up. And in their database, they show that there's only been about 17, I believe, Chinese-based ISDS cases in their database. Over half of them are just since 2020. So this is a very new phenomenon for Chinese investors abroad. Um, and like I said, this is the they're, they're almost all from private Chinese firms. So this is particularly important, as Ignacio said, we see a larger participation of Chinese private investors in the mining sector, particularly in these new minerals like or newly mined minerals like lithium. So as these minerals become larger and larger as um, themes of the relationship, not only in Chile, but also in Bolivia, where a private Chinese consortium won an open tender to develop their lithium, as well as in Argentina, of course, um, the potential for Chinese firms to balk at environmental and social regulations and open up disputes is now on the table in a way that it had never been before. And in fact, there had only been one previous case of a Chinese investor state dispute in Latin America period for any reason, and that involved a tax dispute in Peru. And in that case, the China, that was also a, a private Chinese firm. This was several years ago. In that case, the government of China actually supported the government of Peru against their own private company. And so that stands in great contrast to our current situation where uh, the Ecuador-China FTA was negotiated while this dispute was opening up and the Chinese government was not at all interested in stepping into that arena. And so it becomes more important for than ever <laughs> for Latin American Caribbean governments to make sure that they are protected regarding their environmental and social policies to make sure that they um, as they negotiate new FTAs with China, there are several on the agenda right now, including Uruguay, for example. Um, as that happens, to ensure that the language in those treaties re maintains enough policy space for the goals that Latin American countries have. Um, this is, you know, as I said, we're not seeing Latin America 
treat China as a special partner that's going to get special treatment anymore. We're now seeing Latin America treat China as one more player that needs to compete on a level playing field with Western investors as well. Uh, in those cases, then, we want to make sure, <laughs> uh, all of the observers <laughs> want to make sure that policy space is preserved for all of the actors involved. Um, and Latin America is bringing their own policy goals and agenda to bear. Uh, it'll be more important than ever to make sure that policy space is, is in fact, put into those treaties that are that are being negotiated right now. To Thanks, be fair, I want to I want to reiterate that we we still don't see Chinese firms performing quantitatively or significantly different from Western firms on environmental performance. This mm -hmm. is simply one trait of Western firms: a willingness to open up a dispute when a regulation disfavors them that we've never seen China perform be willing to do before. And, and hopefully it is not a harbinger of future disputes. But as Chile considers a broader participation for its government in the lithium sector, Mexico as well, the possibility is there. And so it'll be important to step carefully. Thanks. That's that's very interesting, Becky, and a really interesting case study, which, as you said, uh, got a little bit under the radar. So uh, thanks, for, thanks for highlighting it. And and a lot of interesting developments there, also thinking on the implementation of the Escazú agreement in Latin America uh, that can also have a repercussion on overall investment from, from China and other countries in, in the region. Uh, a, a lot to, to unpack there, but thanks, thanks Becky. And uh, let me continue with this kind of uh, legal uh, discussion. I want to I use your advantage, your expertise, uh, Ignacio, uh, as a lawyer. Uh, you know a lot of the legal debates that are underway regarding Chinese investment in the region, and we have really seen some legal discussions regarding state-owned uh, companies in Chile, in Peru, and other countries. Could you give us a little bit of a sense of uh, the Chinese engagement and how is it shaping the legal landscape in parts of Latin America and vice versa? Sure, for me. I mean, that I mean, this specific topic has been it's kind of like a recent discussion. It's one of the main debates we've seen uh, recently in relation specifically to the activity of Chinese state-owned enterprises in, in certain industries. Um, um, mainly strategic sectors such as the, the power sector, we in which we've seen a lot a, a big huge transactions, MA transactions being uh, carried out by by state-owned Chinese state-owned enterprises. And it's been happening uh, all over the region, uh, in the case of Chile, in the case of Brazil, this year recently in, in, in Peru. Um, so just to give you an idea of like, um, I mean, these kind of companies, like I already mentioned some of them, China State Grid Corporation of China, they acquired uh, Chilquinta back in 2019 for um, more than 2 billion US dollars. And the same, the year after they acquire another power company locally here in Chile, CGE for 3 billion. In Brazil, it's also a, a, it's a very important situation because like the Chinese, invest, Chinese investment in the power sector represents uh, more than 50 billion, which uh, uh, sums up like more than 75% of the total investment. And in Peru, we, we also, we saw a few years ago, the acquisition by China Yangtze Power, which is a subsidiary of China Three Gorgeous Corporation of uh, uh, Luz del Sur for more than 3.5 billion US dollars. And this year, just a few weeks ago, we saw that China Southern Power Grid International bought in El Peru for 2.9 uh, billion US dollars. So the main concern we've seen here locally from a legal, social, um, political perspective is the increasing participation of Chinese state-owned enterprises in a key sector of the economy, which is the power sector, right? And, and here, I, I would also like to provide some background before referring to the case of Chile, which is like the existence of certain almost 100 central enterprises under the supervision and ownership of the state-owned assets supervision and administration commission of the state council. So there are currently 98 central enterprises that they are owned and indirectly managed by this governmental level uh, uh, body that was created back in 2003, after the reform of several other uh, uh, ministry level uh, bodies in, in, in China to make the administration of central or strategic enterprises uh, more efficient. In the case of Chile, we have a merger control regulation in force that uh, a certain MA transaction 
uh, has to go through a merger control uh, system depending on whether certain thresholds are, are triggered. So this is managed by the National Prosecutor Office. It's called the Fiscalia Nacional Económica or FNE. And here I would like to point out that it's a purely technical review process. So it's not under the uh, grounds of national security, geopolitics is just considering a legal regulation in order to protect the uh, market competition. It's not like what, we, what you see in the States or other markets such as CFIUS, right? right? It's not, they do not consider any national security or uh, they're just purely technical and legal considerations. So, so far, all transactions involving Chinese state-owned enterprises uh, acquiring uh, energy assets in Chile have been cleared um, because based on the FNEs consideration, they do not affect market competition in the, in the market. However, I, I would like to point out that the interpretation of the FNE uh, has been very interesting in the fact that uh, it has considered that all Chinese enterprises, uh, state-owned enterprises under the supervision of SESAC, they are considered related entities based on the definitions of our securities law and our corporation law, which is a very conservative, I would say, approach uh, 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 in relation to the understanding of the nature of uh, Chinese state-owned enterprises. And the fact, or the, the fact behind is that uh, the Chinese Communist Party, it has a certain decision-making influence in uh, uh, appointing some senior level management roles inside those um, uh, central enterprises. So in, 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 in reality, it's very difficult to prove or to know uh, what's, what's the level of coordination of uh, state, central state or enterprises, regardless of the industry, where they come from, um, and also to what extent the Chinese Communist Party can affect daily operations of these central enterprises. So my, my advice as a, as a China scholar uh, in this regard has been that in order to avoid this kind of like uh, obstacles, Chinese SOE, so the Chinese system should uh, consider keep reforming uh, its state-owned enterprises, keep, imp keep improving their corporate governance, and also try to provide better transparency in their management uh, system. Thank you. Thanks so much, uh, Ignacio, really interesting uh, insights. And let me take it on to Margaret. Uh, Margaret, could you share some of the diplomatic key developments that, that you would highlight over the past year? To what extent did they progress or shape China's economic relationship with Latin America? Yeah, I mean, I, I, it's a it's an important question, especially as we talk about economic engagement, because so much of China's diplomatic activity in the region is indeed in, intended to uh, you know, to shape the broader, uh, you know, external environment uh, so that uh, China is able to advance certain agreements in, in the commercial space, in the investment space, um, and even within the political realm in, in, in certain instances. Um, what we're seeing, uh, you know, is what I have described in the past as multi-tiered engagement and multi-tiered diplomacy. That is, you know, continued interest in engaging at a regional level, albeit slightly less so than we've seen in the past. There's still, you know, considerable focus on the China Select Forum, but it's mentioned with less frequency now than it has been uh, in previous years. A renewed interest in engaging at the at the bilateral level, especially, you know, in countries such as Brazil where there is now a, a greater openness to a stronger partnership with China, including on you know, areas of interest, tremendous interest to China, such as renminbi internationalization, uh, bringing Huawei back into the fold in a, in a, in a really critical way within that, uh, within the you know telecommunications space, um, but but wide um, wide ranging other deals were struck obviously between the Lula during the Lula and Xi uh, visit. Um, a lot of other examples of high level meetings um, uh, with with other countries as well. And happy to address you know some of the outcomes from those given our limited time in in the Q and A if of interest. We're also, of course, seeing a lot of engagement at the local level. This continues to be an area of focus. It has been for over a decade, um, but the focus has intensified over the years as we find more and more effort to avoid or hedge against 
uh, you know, inevitable political shifts in in Latin America and their implications, as just as you mentioned, Fermin, right, for for Chinese companies. Um, striking deals at the local level can help to avoid some of the challenges, you know, that that, that are brought about by by you know ever shifting political dynamics um, at the national level. And so that's one one reason why we see a lot more engagement with states, with provinces, and indeed with municipalities. Another is that, as was mentioned by Becky, you know, a lot of the focus right now um, by Chinese companies is on sectors, um, ICT, right, um, but other innovation related sectors and a lot of applications that are, in fact, you know, built for cities, safe cities, smart cities, technologies. And so uh, cities, uh, you know, doing these things requires buy in from from mayors, from municipal officials, uh, even, you know, uh, Kauchari. And as we mentioned, right, the solar plant, the, these these negotiations were struck by the government of Fuhui, so um, province in Argentina. So uh, a lot of focus again at the at the local level, and I would imagine that that will only intensify given the a number of resources, be it party related resources, you know, government related resources, quasi uh, sort of non government governmental uh, bodies, uh, sister provinces, sister cities, networks, all sorts of educational networks are being brought to bear uh, in support of these objectives. And what's really interesting is the extent of activity. Um, of wide range, you know, diplomatic activity in sectors that are indeed of, of profound interest to China. We talked uh, a little bit about, I, mean, I think, still, and for many years, the focus has been on the exportation of excess capacity, right? This includes in the energy sector with all of these acquisitions, right? Uh, and, and both electricity generation and transmission acquisitions, but also other construction projects and indeed the exportation of construction labor, right? Or companies that do these things, not necessarily individuals. Um, also in securing supply chains, um, mining factors prominently in that, especially, uh, you know, mining of critical minerals. And, uh, you know, engaging in also sectors that are of tremendous relevance from a food and energy security perspective, but also, as we see, you know, considerable interest in what China has deemed new infrastructures or these innovation related industries. So I think, uh, you know, increasingly we'll see a lot more activity indeed in support of, uh, of these particular commercial interests um, and from wide ranging actors. And one, I think probably the most prominent recent example was, uh, gosh, I'm even going to forget the, the country because this happens in every single country <laughs> that there was a, there's a, 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 it's in Salta. So I should know that. Shame on me, Fermin. It's in Salta. There is a, there was just recently a, a number of deals struck by a private company there uh, to provide scholarships for the study of mining related fields in China. And so these sorts of, act, all of this ecosystem of diplomatic actors works it together, not always in a coordinated fashion, but certainly to advance similar objectives um, as concerns interest in these varied sectors. Thanks so much, Margaret. Really, really interesting comments. And before we jump into the questions, because we, we actually got a long list here, um, I'm going to ask each of you if you can share in 30 seconds slash one minute, ideally no more than that, because we are running out of time. Uh, if you can give us some highlights in terms of what are you expecting to see this year, uh, either stuff that you are focusing on at the moment that you are going to be working on so we can keep all, all an eye, or if there's any developments that you think are particularly interesting for, for this year. Uh, we are already in May and we have a whole bunch of news, uh, such as the Paraguay elections uh, a few weeks ago. Uh, but let me start with you, Becky. Uh, what, would, what would you highlight for this year? Um, as I've said, uh, Latin American and Caribbean countries are bringing their own agendas and, and agency to bear. The question that I'll be looking to answer is to what extent is China willing to support that? So we see announcements that sound great of EV factories in Brazil and Argentina, uh, EV batteries even as part of the big deal in lithium with the Chinese firm in Bolivia. Uh, the question is whether these are going to materialize and to what extent upstream Chinese companies are willing to go along with the nationalization policies that Mexico and Chile are bringing to bear. So to what extent is China really willing to reciprocate and, and bring these to, into reality will be the question for me. Thanks. Definitely. Uh, really good point. Thanks, Becky. Uh, Ignacio, uh, can you share some insights on your end? Yeah, my say will be like, uh, firstly, like how the relationship between the US and China and the European Union will evolve and the, how that may affect the relationship with Latin America, that's first. 
Second one is more a macroeconomic point, which is like how the Chinese economy and the world economy is going to be behaving in, in, during this year and the next few years. And finally, uh, whether President Xi Jinping, after his confirmation of a third term in office, uh, will keep further reform and liberalization of the Chinese economy and how, again, that may affect the interaction with uh, uh, between China and Latin America. Thank you. Fantastic. Thanks, Ignacio. Uh, so I'm going to go through some of the questions we got. Can I, can I say to... mine real quick? If I mean, I'm oh, sorry. Oh, Margaret, sorry, completely. I'll be super fast. Really, really, really <laughs> sorry. Uh, I, 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 no, I, I just... started looking at the list of the questions. I would I just, got... I would, I would largely, uh, you know, I would largely probably say ditto, but uh, okay. you know, I'll, no, 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 definitely. I'll, just, I'll just say very quickly, um, the, just as, as Ignacio has mentioned, there are so many shifting discussions right now, um, you know, about about China in the in the legal realm and in the economic realm and the regulatory realm, how to handle, you know, what is an increasingly dominant presence uh, among Chinese companies in certain very specific sectors in the region and how to approach that from an antitrust perspective um, and, and other perspectives as well. So that those shifting discussions are really critical. The economic factors in China, you know, that are shaping all of this and the regulations that are putting in, being put in place, including within the financial sector, the centralization of decision making in some of these industries, these sectors, these among these institutions that are so critical in terms of shaping investment, finance, uh, trade with, with the Latin American region will be will be fundamental. And the debt story, right? Uh, China has there's a lot of debt owed to China in, um, among global South nations. How will China grapple with that? How will that all evolve is is really fundamental. And just as Becky is is looking at the upgrading story, right? Uh, how much of this will actually materialize? China is talking a lot about its commitment to up economic upgrading, to industrial capacity. This has, in fact, been part of the narrative since around 2014. So will it deliver in the ways that it's promising? And I'll leave it at that. Fantastic. Thanks, Mary. Yeah, definitely. We haven't spoken that much on, on debt, but that's definitely a big one. Uh, we actually have a, have a question on that. But I'm going to go through some of these. Uh, uh, let me start off. There's, there's one question which we don't have the name of uh, the sender, but um, which is either to Becky or to Margaret, because uh, apparently either one of you were on a recent podcast, uh, and you I don't, I don't know which one, and you mentioned that the profile of the relationship between China and Latin America is changing from giving loans to negotiating those that already exist. And moreover, when one looks at Central America and Caribbean, the debt to GDP ratio is quite high, especially in countries such as Puerto Rico, Costa Rica, El Salvador. And these are countries that are more uh, DC oriented compared to our neighbors. How do you see these countries need to lower their debt levels vis-a-vis uh, -vis the fact that much of these debts aren't Chinese. Uh, I don't know if uh, Margaret or Becky, have you recently been in a podcast? <laughs> we were on one together. I think. Oh, okay, <laughs> okay. Be okay. Be Be Becky, please feel free to-, to uh, The countries I'll be watching include uh, Suriname and Dominica in this situation. So Suriname is the country in Latin America where China represents the highest share of its debt among other Lat among all Latin American countries. It represents something like 20% of uh, Suriname's public and publicly guaranteed debt. And Suriname has just started a process with the IMF and has gotten uh, assurances that its creditors will work along with it. So I'll be watching that to give us some signals about China's approach to Caribbean basin countries in particular. Uh, Dominique is on the opposite end of the spectrum in that it has one of the highest, if not the highest, debt service to government revenue ratios over the next few years, but it predominantly owes multilaterals. And so the extent to, and of course, there's been significant tension about which creditors should really be stepping up the most. And so the reaction of the of all creditors to both of these difficult situations will be something to watch to give us a flavor of what to expect thereafter. Thanks. Thanks, Becky. Uh, do you want to add something, Margaret? No, no, that's true. Oh, okay. Uh, well, actually, the next question is for you. Uh, Gary Prevost uh, from the College of St. Benedict uh, is asking on a question on Chinese funding. He says that for this past year, how did the Chinese 800 million and the new sources like the New Development Bank compare with the new loans from the US and Europe? Hmm. You know, gosh, I didn't look up the I didn't look up the IDB numbers and and some of the others. Becky, I don't know if you have those on hand, but I can give you a sense of so Brazil and and I also didn't do the calculations on, in aggregate on on the NDB, but Brazil received 
um, from the New Development Bank, the BRICS Bank, in in 22, 10 sovereign loans, right, which amounted to a fair, a fairly sizable um, overall overall sum. And the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank also provided 100 million to the Banco de the, the Brazilian or the Development Bank, excuse me, of Minas Gerais. Uh, to finance renewable energy projects in the Brazilian in that Brazilian state. So Ecuador, interestingly, also received finance from the AIIB in 2022, but to address liquidity constraints um, of, you know, private and small and medium-sized enterprises um, amid the COVID-19 crisis. So I have some math to do, and hopefully I can put that together and make some comparisons and send those out on Twitter. But thank you for the call to action. <laughs> Thanks, Margaret. Um... This is a question, actually, uh, we got a few comments on, on this um, to any of you who wants to reply. Uh, we got some questions over the political instability in, in some of the Latin American countries. Uh, we can highlight Peru, we can highlight Ecuador recently. Uh, how does this uh, affect in any way Chinese investment in the region? Uh, and what kind of repercussion, if any, do you think this can have to any of you who wants to reply? I don't, Ignacio, if, if you'd like to take Well, I, mean, I, I can say like a, a few comments, like uh, uh, from my, my, my research, I've seen like, if you see, for example, the data uh, of Chinese activity, like investment activity in the, in the region, they firstly, uh, like back in 2010, they approached countries like uh, with more similar, like G2G type of governments, such as Venezuela and the like. However, because of the increasing instability, political instability in those countries, we afterwards, we saw a shift uh, from those countries to more stable ones, such as the case of Chile, Colombia, uh, 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 well, at that time, Peru. Uh, however, recently, because of the political stability in Peru, for instance, we've, uh, we've been having conversation with law firms in Peru as well, and, and Chinese companies, they've been making a lot of questions because they are concerned about the situation there. And that's similar to what we saw before with Venezuela. So definitely, there is a concern of Chinese companies. They follow what's happening in the different markets. In the case of Chile, uh, at least, for instance, when we drafted a new uh, uh, con constitution, they were in a way concerned, but they still see the country as a, a more stable one to other to other countries. But they, of course, they 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 are uh, looking an eye on that, and 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 that it may affect, as it did in the past, the activity of uh, foreign investment in different countries. So they may move. The reason why, even though Chile is a small country and we've been receiving a lot of Chinese foreign investment, is that they, in the end, they understand that a stable economy, a stable country, it's a, a more safe uh, return on investment. Thank you. Thanks, Ignacio. Uh, does anyone want to add something, Becky, Margaret? I, could, I, could I just simply say that, I mean, one sort of canary in the coal mine, I don't know if I should be using that particular uh, phrasing, but is, you know, to look at the, the insurance landscape, right? Because uh, Sinosure, other insurers, you know, not, not all of these are, are, are guaranteed, I mean, the finance is guaranteed, not all of the projects have, you know, significant backing, but the tendencies among the insurance companies will give us a good sense of kind of how much risk China in general, or Sinosure certainly, right, is willing to take, and that will have, you know, effects on the extent to which um, we'll see engagement in certain sectors for sure. But there is this very ongoing and in-depth and, you know, uh, you know, debate on risk um, among different industries, right, ongoing in Beijing. And so I think following that to whatever extent we can, but also looking at those signals, for example, within the insurance industry is a helpful way to kind of figure out where things might head. Thanks, Margaret. I appreciate it. I'll just uh, uh, circle back okay, a little yes. bit to uh, your area of focus, environmental and social regulations and how they how they work into all of this. And that is uh, obviously the political instability in Peru is on everyone's mind, particularly with one of the world's largest copper mines, Las Bambas, yes. Chinese investment, uh, and the fact that that firm has been under almost constant protest since it opened up because of problems with local consultations and uh, regarding social and environmental regulations. So what's interesting here to me is that I think it's not coincidental that it's the China Chinese Chamber of Commerce for Mining and Chemicals that is the first industry group in China to follow the Chinese uh, green BRI guidelines in developing consultation and grievance mechanisms. They've got a draft policy out for consultation right now on a grievance mechanism. And I think it's not coincidental that that's 
one of the largest Chinese overseas mining investments in the world has been under this kind of protest that intensified during the recent political chaos in, in Peru um, related to the ways consultations were and were not carried out regarding that mine. So of course, it's going to be on the mind of investors considering future mining investments in the region. But we're got, again, as Margaret said, the insurance field is, is where you can look to see signals going into it. And I think we are beginning to see industry groups trying to cushion themselves by developing policies that can highlight problems before they get to this level of constant protests. Thanks. Thanks, Becky. Um, we are going to do one more question because we, we are running out of time. We have one question from uh, Barbara Stallings from Beijing. She says, I'm not convinced that Latin American countries are really taking agency in relations with China. Ecuador and others are requesting changes in types of exports, but what evidence, what evidence is there that this will come about? China has not been willing in the past to make any efforts to help Latin America move up the value change in the experts uh big question uh you know on the on the overall overall economy of the region and how how what kind of role does china play does anyone want to comment on this um, i can get us started again this takes us back to what i'll be watching this year so in the past she mentions ecuador it's great that you're on the call by the way barbara it's, it's really nice to hear hear your name um we ecuador in ecuador is an interesting case because china was there to support the Refineria del Pacifico to try to increase the value added of Ecuadorian exports, but that was a joint project with Venezuela who wasn't able to fulfill their part. And so it fell through. And many of us were wondering, will China be willing to support efforts to go up the value chain with new minerals like lithium in, a sa in the same way, perhaps with hopefully with better success? And the big thing to watch is going to be that Bolivian tender. They look, they they have been for a decade now looking for international partners to enter a JV, a joint venture with the Bolivian state lithium company, uh, not only to mine lithium, but also to industrialize that lithium to the point that it can be turned into batteries. That, that tender has now been completed, a Chinese consortium won over competition with US and Russian, I, I believe other firms that also competed. The big question is where are we gonna be at the end of this year? Will we see any results from that? Uh, I've seen headlines saying they should have initial results for their tests, um, their geological tests this uh, mid-year, July or August. So that's what I'll be watching to see whether there's any chance of actually moving up. Among all South American countries, Bolivia might be the one that has struggled the most mightily to develop these tremendous lithium resources that it has. And so if there's any test of China's willingness and ability to support moving up the value chain, it'll be Bolivia. And we'll see the answer to that beginning in a few months from now. So great question and thank you. Thanks, Becky. Uh, Margaret Ignacio, do you want to add something on this? I, I also, I'll, I'll simply say that, I mean, I think we are absolutely seeing agency from, from Latin American actors at various administrative levels and, and actually, you know, deal in, you know, cre crafting these deals and putting forth projects that are indeed of critical interest from a growth perspective, um, more so than we've seen in the past. What remains to be seen, just as Becky said, is how much, uh, you know, how much movement we'll see in terms of the overall structural dynamics of the trade and, and investment landscapes. Um, and, you know, I, What's one interesting example and thing that we'll we'll need to continue to focus on is is are these debt negotiations, and indeed, you know, the, on the Ecuadorian side with these most recent negotiations, a lot of that was brought forth by the Ecuadorian government, um, China, Chinese banks, China, Chinese oil companies participated in that. Uh, whether they will fundamentally alter, you know, the 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 dynamics at play in that debt relationship, I mean, many have described those those negotiations as helpful, but as kicking the can down the road is another question entirely. Entirely right, but um, but there is does seem to be more of a, a role right in, in talking about the need to rebalance and, and address some of these asymmetries and the extent to which China responds to this or not really remains to be seen. So these will be critical years to watch these things, just as we've all mentioned. Thanks, Marco. Uh, Ignacio, anything else before we wrap up? Sure, like just a, like a, a very brief comment in relation to the agribusiness, what's happening in the agribusiness sector here in, in the south of uh, Latin America, because like I, I in a way I, I disagree because like Chinese 
they've been indeed um, adding value to the to the to the industry. It's very common to see, especially in the in small to mid-sized companies, that the Chinese are providing capital. They're providing capital for developing a more sophisticated infrastructure, for instance, for exploiting the the soil here in 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 Chile. And if you think, for example, the case of wine, the case of cherries the case of salmon, because China itself, the market, the consumer there is getting also more sophisticated. So that's the reason why they've been pushing and investing for a change in the industry locally here in Chile. And that, then, then you see like a real change and improvement of packaging, the development of different type of fruits because of genetics and so on. There are very clear examples of JVs uh, being done by big companies such as uh, Lenovo Group of Legend Group, and local players such as Hortifruit, which is the main, the world's largest uh, blueberry uh, exporter in the world. So there are very clear examples in, in, in which you see in the agribusiness sector specifically that there's been an improvement of the of the value chain. That's a, a, a comment I would, like, I would like to make. Thank you, Ignacio. I appreciate it. And I know we already run out of time, actually, but uh, thanks so much, everyone, for your fantastic questions. And feel free to stay in touch with... Uh, um, Ignacio with Becky with with Margaret uh, over the research they they constantly are keeping an eye on the relations between China and Latin America and doing fantastic fantastic research on this uh, so do, do do keep in touch and there, I'm sure there's going to be more activities coming up uh, over the over the next few months uh, so thanks again for joining thanks for making the time and thanks to our three fantastic speakers uh, Becky Margaret Ignacio thanks for for your time and for your valuable insights. And um, just wrapping up, uh, thanks for uh, organizing this to the Inter-American Dialogue and to the Boston University. And yeah, let's stay in touch. And if you got any more questions, please feel free to follow up with, with the speakers uh, later on. Thanks, Ignacio. Thanks, Becky. Thanks, Margaret. Thank you. Have a great day. Bye-bye. Thank you.